Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning, and I very much appreciate uh, Dr. Merrigan's uh, comments earlier today, uh, because she may have said a lot of what I could have said, and she probably said it better than I will ever be able to say it. But I hope that she left you with the understanding that this is a complicated and complex question uh, that doesn't lend itself to a single answer uh, and doesn't lend itself to a, a, a three to four minute discussion. So uh, I'm going to do my best to touch on a couple of things that perhaps you haven't heard today or to expound on a few things that need to be emphasized. Uh, I suspect that you all have already heard about our efforts uh, with USAID and the State Department with the Feed the Future initiative within the Obama administration, the fact that 7 million producers have been helped to expand productivity, that we've established credit programs, export assistance programs, working with countries uh, to uh, reform their regulations to allow for tr trading opportunities in Sub-Saharan Africa and Central America and some Asian countries. I suspect that you know about our efforts on post-harvest uh, post storage and improving that opportunity in developing countries. So I'm not going to touch on that, but if that hasn't been touched on, I'd be happy to answer a question about it. I'm really going to focus on what we're doing here at the U.S. Uh, at home. And I think first and foremost it starts with making sure that the soil that we have in this country uh, is used properly, uh, is invested in, and is preserved. Which is why we launched a soil health campaign uh, at USDA uh, through our NRCS programs, uh, really focused on cover crops, uh, on double cropping, on better nutrient management, on better irrigation systems, on agroforestry all designed in an effort to conserve and preserve the precious soil that we have. Because we're not going to be able to feed the future, much less feed the people in this country, if we don't do a, a continually better job of conserving and preserving uh, our precious soil. We are blessed uh, with extraordinary topsoil in this country. We need to preserve it and protect it. Part of that involves uh, a significant focus on research, understanding what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we're very proud of the work that we do, both externally and internally in research through our Agricultural Research Service and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Excited about the opportunity that uh, former Secretary Glickman is leading uh, with the new private foundation that was established under the Farm Bill to expand agricultural research. Uh, but we believe it is necessary to open up what we know to the world uh, so that we can all do a collaboratively better job of using the research that we've already invested in, which is why we established the Open Data Initiative, which is unlocking all of the research that USDA has done in the past making it available online, encouraging people to use it. It's why we have established and worked with the international community and an open data uh, for agriculture and nutrition assistance program, which we launched with the United Kingdom, uh, ex encouraging other countries uh, to open up their uh, publicly funded research. Research is critically important. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we are focusing some time and attention on the impacts of climate change uh, and how it will uh, compromise or advance our capacity to feed the future. We established uh, it, uh, a year or so ago uh, a climate hub effort, seven climate hubs in the United States in each region of the country, focused on the vulnerabilities uh, and opportunities that exist with a changing climate in terms of agriculture and forestry production. We have, uh, in addition to the seven climate hubs, we have three sub hubs, which are really focused on very specific uh, issues involving climate. We all know uh, the climate is changing. We all know that it has an impact and effect on agriculture. We want to be prepared to deal with it, to mitigate it, and to adapt to those changes. So these climate hubs are now doing uh, extensive research, uh, working collaboratively with universities uh, and with the private sector so that agriculture in the United States, both big, small, uh, and medium-sized operators, are equipped with the technologies and techniques that will allow them to adjust uh, to a changing climate. We didn't just simply focus on what's happening here in the U.S. Uh, we have been part of a global research alliance that was launched uh, several years ago by the U.S. and New Zealand. Uh, now 41 countries that are collaborating uh, on research uh, in terms of crop production, livestock production, rice production, uh, and terminology uh, so that as we focus on climate change globally, uh, we're all speaking the same language. Uh, we're all collaborating. We're not uh, becoming redundant with our research, uh, that we're focused on strategies to deal with improved crop production, livestock production in the face of climate change, rice production, which is extraordinarily important. Uh, we just simply uh, needed to collaborate uh, better with the international community, so we, uh, along with uh, Vietnam uh, and uh, the Netherlands, uh, helped to launch uh, the Climate Smart Agricultural Alliance at the UN opening uh, in September. Uh, now over 100 
countries and organizations are working to that together collaboratively to focus on this issue of climate. So whether it's improved soil health here at home, uh, whether it's expanding research opportunities, working with the international community, we are very much focused on uh, making sure that we are better prepared and best prepared to have the, lead, the U.S. lead this effort at feeding uh, the future. You know, when I saw the topic, Feed the Future, I was uh, puzzled by exactly what I should talk about. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't suggest that Feeding the Future also involves making sure that our kids here at home are fed properly, uh, which is why we're engaged in an interesting conversation with our friends in Congress about the importance of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Uh, but all of this uh, is extraordinarily important. All of it is complicated. All of it requires a, an extended conversation. Let me finish, because I know you want to get to questions, with one other aspect that often is not focused on in terms of feeding the future, and that is the fact that we are already producing a substantial amount of food that finds its way uh, into the into the landfills, uh, into, uh, into a waste stream. Uh, we waste in the United States 133 billion pounds of food every year. To give you a sense of this, that's about a third of everything that's grown and raised and produced in this country is wasted. Uh, if you want to see more about this, there's a wonderful exhibit uh, at the uh, National Geographic uh, uh, location here in Washington, D.C. that focuses on this issue of food waste internationally. Uh, a third of the food produced in the U.S., 30 percent of the food produced uh, across the world is wasted, which is why we launched at USDA with uh, the help and assistance of EPA a food waste initiative that now includes 200 partners focused on reducing waste initially, uh, on reusing uh, food products that oftentimes folks throw away thinking that they're no longer safe to consume when in fact they are, and uh, recycling uh, food waste so that we can reduce the amount of food waste that goes into our landfills. You might be surprised, I certainly I was, to know that the single largest solid waste component of landfills in the United States today is food. It is a huge producer of methane. So if we're serious about climate, if we're serious about feeding the future, if we're serious about uh, adapting and mitigating to a changing climate, food waste becomes a critically important issue here in this country and around the world. And USDA is prepared to provide assistance and help and strategies uh, to deal with reducing uh, and hopefully uh, eliminating a substantial amount of food waste in this country. This is a wonderful topic. I wish I had two hours to talk about it, but I think between what I said and what Dr. Merrigan said, hopefully you get a flavor for what USDA has been engaged in and how seriously we are taking this particular issue of feeding the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, you, you were so um, strong at the end about waste. Let's just stay there for a minute. What should we be doing to mitigate some of this waste and also the greenhouse gases? Agriculture is the biggest producer, right, of greenhouse gases. Well, uh, in the United States, uh, agriculture is responsible for about 9% of our greenhouse gas emissions, which is less than the international amount. It's about 14% internationally. Look, food waste is an issue that starts with portion sizes. Uh, you know, I, I use the example of myself and, and my wife, Christy. I'm, uh, you know, I refer to her as, a, my better, uh, as she is my better third, uh, not half. Um, you know, I'm, I'm about at least twice as big as she is, but when we go to a restaurant, she gets the same portion size I do in most cases. Uh, and the reality is she can't eat it all, and a lot of it is not conducive to take home. So that ends up in... Uh, somewhere in a landfill uh, here in D.C. Or, or in our home in Iowa. Portion sizes. Uh, it's about making sure that people are sensitive uh, to this issue of not taking more than they need. Uh, it's also about making sure that we do a better job of explaining to people what the best buy date means or used by date means on cans and food products. It doesn't mean uh, that you have to throw it away the day after uh, that date. Uh, it's still safe to consume. Uh, and, and a better understanding of that and a better capacity to redirect resources that may not be acceptable for a restaurant, but might be appropriate for a community kitchen, to be able to figure out ways in which that food can be redirected more efficiently and effectively. That's why we're uh, working with, uh, uh, we'll be working in 2015 with uh, technology companies to figure out applications that pit folks can use to redirect food that is no longer useful for a purpose, a specific purpose, but could still be consumed. And then finally, it is about composting. It is about figuring out ways in which uh, we, we can divert it from a landfill. Uh, for example, at USDA, we drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> we stay awake a lot. 
because we've got a lot to do. Well, we're now composting all the coffee grounds uh, at USDA. And we're using it in part uh, to, uh, to assist us with our people. Where do you partners. do that? We, we do it right in, in, in the USDA facility, uh, just outside the facility, and we use it to help uh, with our People's Garden, which is located on site, and uh, one of, which is one of 2,000 People's Gardens, uh, actually 2,100 People's Gardens that we've, we've established. Well, um, let me go back to where are the biggest, the United States is the biggest producer of um, food in the world, right? Well, the United States and China are the two biggest producers. And you're the Secretary of Agriculture. So what is, I'd like to hear from you about what you see as the U.S. role in helping the world feed itself. Well, it's a leadership position. Uh, and it is, a, it is an opportunity for the U.S. to exercise the kind of leadership that I think most of us want this country to exercise. Uh, I mean, the reality is uh, the image of the U.S. overseas is somewhat displayed by the images that people see of the U.S. And what images are they seeing today? Uh, they're seeing uh, images that are primarily military in many, many countries, in many areas. Uh, and certainly that's an important role that U.S. plays. But I, I think we have a role in working with individual farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa and Central America and Southeast Asia to suggest that there are ways in which they can be more productive uh, in a very sustainable way uh, that will be beneficial for them and their families and, and their country. I think the U.S. can lead in that effort. I think the U.S. clearly has a responsibility of adjusting and, and calculating precisely how climate is going to impact agriculture. If anyone sits here today thinking that the climate's not changing and that it's not going to have a profound impact on agriculture, they're just simply not, they're, they're just simply not aware. The reality is that as the temperatures warm in this country, it will change the growing seasons. It will place greater stresses in some areas on livestock. It will impact what is grown and where it is grown and how much it is grown. We'll see more intensive weather patterns. We'll see more intense storms. We'll see longer droughts. We'll see floods. All of that has to- And how do you help farmers guard against this mess? Well, that's why we have the hubs. That's why we established the climate hubs, uh, to essentially begin the process now of evaluating precisely what's happening in the climate and, and its impact, and then de deciding what's the best approach. If it's, for example, concerns about water, scarcity of water, the use of cover crops. Uh, the use of, uh, uh, of cover crops can substantially retain limited moisture. Uh, agroforestry could potentially be incorporated in, in some parts of the, of, the, uh, of the country. There are strategies and ways in which we can, through research, identify ways. There's also the issue of, of, of seed quality and, and the research that's being done. We're mapping the genome of, of various products so that we have a better understanding of precisely the stresses that, uh, that they'll, be, they'll be facing and, and how we might be able to, through technology, design seeds that will be able to be more resistant. You know, the reality is probably the best thing the United States could do would be to encourage the entire world to embrace science. There is a very interesting dynamic that goes on in the area of agriculture and science. On the one hand, we've got people who deny that climate is changing or that it's not a big deal or that nobody really needs to be paying much attention to it. On the other hand, we have folks who have expressed concerns about various ways in which seed technologies are being developed. Uh, and the reality is, it, in both cases, it's, it's really discounting the capacity of science. And I think one thing the United States can do and should do and ought to do and is in a great position to do is to make sure that science is respected and to make sure that people understand that science is part of the answer to this issue of how you feed the future. Um, Chai, you brought up China. Um, what's their role and what's the role of other big producers when we're looking at making sure that nobody's hungry? Well, I think China uh, obviously has some some very significant challenges, which is that they have millions of farmers. And the reality is that they are moving towards a system that will require fewer farmers and how they are going to move those people uh, off the land or how they're going to f create a system that will allow them to, to feed their own people uh, more effectively and more efficiently. Right now, they are very dependent. Uh, on other countries like the U.S. I think they're uncomfortable with that. Uh, and as a result, they create uh, market instability because of that level of uncomfortableness of, of being dependent. Uh, there need to be, I think, better, uh, more understanding of the fact that, that there are, there, there is a interrelationship here in agriculture and in trade that will facilitate the capacity of us to feed the future when we focus on what all of us do best. Uh, that we don't necessarily have to all be self-sufficient. That, that, that notion is, I think, 
somewhat counterproductive to uh, the capacity of the globe to feed the future. Um, I think that the China can work with the U.S. Uh, on uh, research projects. I think China can work with the U.S. on regulatory systems that allows the, the science of agriculture to get into the stream of commerce uh, efficiently. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things that we could do with China. Um, when you go to Iowa or you go to farms all around America, what is it that farmers ask you for? And what, what do you think they need, either in terms of other policies or programs to help them meet the need? Well, it depends on what size farming operation I'm going to. If I go, yesterday I was in Philadelphia at a uh, farm to school program, which Dr. Merrigan helped to launch uh, through our Know Your Farm initiative, which has been extraordinarily successful in encouraging folks to embrace local and regional food production, which I think is a really important component of agriculture. It, it, it injects diversity of size and of, of production uh, into agriculture that's necessary. You go to those small producers, they're interested in market. They're interested in figuring out ways in which they can encourage more consumption of fill in the blank, apples, oranges, whatever it might be. Uh, and what, that's what know, know Your Farmer is about, is about, in part, developing opportunities for expanded market opportunities. If you go to a large production-sized agricultural operation, the, they're very concerned about export markets and the stability of the market. They're also concerned uh, about the impacts of regulations uh, and whether or not uh, they, they perceive the need for particular regulations. There's quite a bit of debate and discussion right now on waters of the U.S., an EPA rule that's out there that's caused a lot of concern. Uh, some of it, I think, based on a misunderstanding of what the rule is designed to do. Uh, part of it is, is, is potentially uh, legitimate in terms of, uh, of the concern that they have about the terrain of many farms. If you have a bed and you have a bank and you have any water flowing through it, as they interpret the EPA waters of the U.S. rule, it would require uh, permits and licensing and, and things of that nature. That's a very difficult hurdle for them. Um, and so that's going to, I think, yeah, involve. Big, um, we're going to go and do you have a question from Allison? And then I think we're going to have to wrap up, even though we could keep going. Oh, one question. Um, uh, I've got quite a few. Um, how about one of, somebody earlier on Twitter talked a little bit about this idea of subsidizing cover crops to address monoculture concerns. Can you maybe comment on that idea? Well, we are engaged right now uh, in, uh, there's been a 350% increase in the number of acres now engaged in cover crop. Uh, production. Part of the problem with cover crops isn't so much the need for subsidy as it is the need for market. The, if you're going to ask a producer to put resources to produce the cover crop, and that cover crop has a conservation benefit, but there's no market for it, it makes it a little hard for some producers, particularly mid-sized producers who are having a tough time economically, to justify that expenditure. So it's important for us to create new opportunities for use of cover crops. Uh, as energy crops, uh, as the feedstocks for new bio-based products, uh, the ability to use uh, products to produce plastics or chemicals that are bio-based, uh, not petroleum-based, not fossil fuel-based. This is an opportunity for us to expand market opportunities for cover crops. If you do that, you're going to see a lot of people interested in cover crops. Uh, uh, you know, we are currently, just one other thing, we are currently providing assistance working with our crop insurance programs, a variety of other ways in which we can encourage and incent people reducing the barriers that exist today to cover cropping. For example, if you've got cover crops that may compromise your ability to get crop insurance on your principal crop, we don't want that barrier to exist. One more, um, about immigration reform and the relationship between immigration reform um, and what's going on in agriculture in this country. And can you talk a little bit about what's at stake? Well, look, uh, we're not producing as much as we're capable of producing. We're not harvesting as much as we're, we're planting because we simply don't have the hands to do the work. And the reality is there needs to be a comprehensive immigration program in this country that corrects uh, the broken system, that fixes the broken system that we have today. The President's executive action will help. Uh, potentially anywhere from 250 to 400,000 farm workers could potentially qualify for that opportunity to, be, uh, to come out of the shadows for, a, an extent, for an extended period of time but it still isn't what is necessary. Congress needs to act. If we're to maximize our capacity and our production capacity, if we're to maximize the, the ability of the U.S. to produce food, we're going to have to have immigration reform. We have got to have more hands, both on the field, uh, in the orchards, uh, and, in the, and, and in the processing facilities. And without immigration reform, we are going to be constantly understaffed. It's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Comprehensive immigration reform will reduce the budget deficit, 
will shore up the social security system, will provide border security, and will meet the needs of many industries, agriculture and high-tech industries alike. Uh, it is unbelievable to me that Congress cannot find the will or the way to get this done. It's, it's an outrage. Um, one more uh, question. Um, we are rich. We produce a lot of food. We've been talking uh, a lot this morning about trying to help the rest of the world feed itself. How do we begin fixing this problem you talked about in your remarks about too many people undernourished and even hungry in our country? Well, uh, it's, first of all, understanding and appreciating the role that nutrition programs across the board provide in terms of our country and the stability it creates in this country. It is often underappreciated that the food programs we have help to stabilize people who struggle, helps to provide them uh, adequate resources to, to receive nourishment, which means that they're not as hungry as they would otherwise be. And the reality is around the world, we know what happens when you have a disproportionate number of hungry people. It provides, it creates instability, number one. Number two, understanding and appreciating that who it is that's receiving this assistance. Uh, there is the belief on the part of some that those who are receiving nutrition assistance through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, food stamps, are people that are capable of working and uh, just choose not to work and are just basically uh, living, off, uh, living off the rest of us. The reality is that only 8%, 7 to 8% of SNAP beneficiaries are cash welfare recipients. The other 92% are senior citizens, people with severe disabilities, children or people who are actually in the workforce who are working but working either part-time hours or working at a minimum wage. If we raise the minimum wage, just raise the minimum wage, we, we could substantially reduce the number of SNAP beneficiaries. Now, what we have decided to do at USDA is to, is to focus on the people who are able-bodied because most of those people want to work, but they're having a hard time finding work. So we have put out, uh, through the Farm Bill, a pilot project uh, designed to challenge states to be more creative and more innovative about getting work and people who are on SNAP connected. And we're going to see those pilots uh, be funded in February, and hopefully over the course of the next couple of years, we'll do a better job of putting folks to work, reducing the numbers. But it's, a, it's an appreciation for those nutrition programs. And then finally, the, the, the importance of the school nutrition programs. You know, I was uh, yesterday at that farm to school, uh, a principal or a CFO of one of the charter schools in Philadelphia was talking about the fact that 75 to 80 percent of kids in that school are free and reduced lunch. And half of their calories are consumed at that school meal. So we want to make sure that when half or a third of calories are consumed by kids at school meals, that we make sure that those calories are nutrition packed, right? And that we also address the issue of weekends and summer feeding. I'm proud of the fact that we've increased the number of summer feeding meals by 17 million uh, meals in the last couple of years through a concerted effort of working with partners around the country to raise the awareness of the need for summer feeding programs. I'm proud of the work we've done in improving WIC and the nutritional value of the WIC package. I'm proud, really proud of the work we've done in school nutrition. But a lot of those are now coming under attack, and we need to make sure that uh, the gains that, we've, that we've, we've developed over the last couple of years are preserved and enhanced. 